This gives me a chance not only to thank you, but to thank TransLink, who brought Jeanette here. Isn't it interesting when someone comes from out of town and says how terrific TransLink is? <laughs> this being a rare occasion when that happens, I do think we should give a round of applause to TransLink. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to turn the lights up here. We've got one, two mics. So this is your chance. Because we're recording it, we would ask you to come up to the mics and ask any question you'd like of Jeanette, or perhaps you have a comment or two you'd like to make as well. We welcome that. Who's first? There we go. Howdy. Thanks for the, thanks for the talk. Um, my name is Des, and uh, my question has two parts. I'd like to hear um, one thing that you think Vancouver could most show um, to New York to improve cycling and um, in the other direction as well. What can New York most teach Vancouver um, to improve cycling? Thanks. Well, one of the things that I took a note on right away is that your street signs actually have bike logos on them where your bike lanes are, and we don't have that, and I think that's a great idea, so I'm taking that back. The sign shop's already taken orders, uh, <laughs> so that, that one is a great one. Um, and I really think that the protected bike lanes, we need to have, a, a, our major world-class cities like Vancouver need to have a, a network of protected bike lanes. It's not enough... <laughs> That's how we're going to get the increases, you know, when people feel really safe uh, to get around. So, yeah. Hi. Um, anyways, I, uh, thanks for the presentation again. It's really amazing. Um, I did a stint living in Paris uh, a couple years ago, and uh, it was really quite amazing. And I remember the first time I visited Paris that there was uh, almost no bike infrastructure. And going back with the Vélib and the whole thing, it was pretty, pretty amazing. And it's obvious that when you see that there is an uh, there's there's a very visible increase in cycling, you know, with with the with the uh, associated benefits, um, but there is still this cultural uh, debate about cycling in terms of do we put in this physical infrastructure uh, or do we somehow otherwise alter the culture so that it's something more like, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, where there is this um, uh, unregulated negotiation of street space. Um, so as much as, you know, uh, bike lanes are, are uh, protected bike lanes are really important, and perhaps in New York with the congestion, it's really, it's really, uh, really necessary. Um, what are your views on kind of like both sides of that kind of cultural argument? Well, I think, you know, Paris has seen a, a huge transformation. They now have a 4% uh, modal share uh, by biking, and lots of people that had their bikes uh, in their apartments are now also out augmenting the, the Valib system that they have there. So I think that's been a great success. Um, so we're looking closely at that. I mean, different cities, you need to, tra to tailor transportation solutions to meet the needs of different cities. I mean, we have 8.2 million people in the city of New York, so sort of unregulated uh, approach is not a great, uh, it's a recipe for, you know, scrum. Uh, so, you know, there's, we have day-to-day -day battles with, you know, pedestrians and cyclists and motorists, and really where, what mode you're in really dictates your behavior. If you're a pedestrian, you know, you, too many cars, those cyclists come out of nowhere, you know, if you're a motorist, it's like, oh, my God, those pedestrians, they just walk willy-nilly into the street, the headphones on, you know, texting away. You know, I mean, and cyclists think everybody's crazy, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's a war out there, you know. But what we're trying to do is really engineer safe streets so that all users of our system feel safe, whether you're a pedestrian, whether you're a cyclist, whether you're a motorist. You've, we've got to bring balance. I talk a lot about uh, bringing urban acupuncture to the streets of New York, and that's really, that's part of it. It's targeted interventions. Particularly now, we're focusing on driving traffic fatalities down, and so again, as I mentioned, you know, kids and seniors, and you know, it's great if your streets are safe, whether you're seven or 70, then they're safe for everybody. So that's really the orientation. Hi, Stuart Ramsey with the city of Burnaby. Uh, one of the things that's often commented on is the, the scale and the speed of the changes that you've implemented in New York. Can you offer some thoughts on, on what made that possible to, to proceed on, on, on so quickly and at that scale, and whether it's just some could be just fortuitous circumstances that you found or others could be specific strategies that the DOT took to, to seize opportunities or what, what made it possible? That's a good question. First, we start uh, with the umbrella of Plan YC. 
um, because there was really tremendous buy-in about we need a different approach if we're going to continue to be a world-class city. And so that sustainability uh, umbrella really went a long way to set the table differently uh, for our projects and programs. Um, also importantly, so there's an increased recognition that we need more uh, efficient streets, we need more transit, we need more biking and cycling. Uh, so there's an understanding of that. And, but New Yorkers are, you know, we're skeptical a lot, you know. We, you know, we're tired of these plans that take 25 years to implement. And so we really worked hard to bring the, the reality of a greater, greener New York to the streets of New York quickly. So we set up a rapid implementation team so that, you know, I like to say you can, you, know, you can do a lot with a paint can and a paintbrush, you know. So we're literally sort of painting the outlines uh, of this greener city. So that we, uh, we were able to make a lot of these changes without uh, heavy construction or a lot of digging in the streets, and that, I think, was a really uh, important uh, uh, approach. And I think it's paid off. You know, Every time we literally roll out the orange barrels, they're, they're just ready to go. Um, and people are really hungry for, for these public spaces. And so there's been uh, a lot of support for that, and, and so we're really doing targeted interventions. And a lot of areas... You know, it's sort of the legacy of, of uh, Robert Moses, you know, one of the positive legacies of Robert Moses. He paved a lot of New York City, but now we've got a lot of uh, capacity to play with. And so, you know, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a gift of a kind. Uh, so, <laughs> so there's a lot of factors. <laughs> All right, nice job. Um, and it actually bring, sort of brings to mind a line in a song, something about if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. Yeah. Uh, you talked about better streets equaling better business, and the picture depicted a lot of uh, pedestrian traffic and, and things that uh, certainly accrue from that. From the point of view of the muffler shop owner, uh, there might be some disagreement. Now, you did also refer to increased property values. Has there been some sort of a strategy to perhaps consider purchasing the properties of those businesses that consider themselves to be totally car dependent? No. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Louis Villegas, uh, sometime upstate New York resident. Um, you said creative financing, and you didn't mean Bernie Madoff. Um, I don't what? think I said creative financing. I think oh. Larry said creative financing. <laughs> <laughs> well, he can answer the question. I'm very interested in uh, ways that municipalities can generate capital that don't involve deals that have to be made behind closed doors with developers on a one-to-one -one basis. What kind of things have you guys using? Well, we're, we're using some different kinds of strategies. We're doing this seven-line extension you know, to the west side of Manhattan, uh, using a, a tax increment financing program. And that's a really important strategy going forward so that basically we're, the, the increase in property values associated with the transit uh, investment go to you know, the, the city and the agencies so that you know, we're actually bringing it back to you know, the people. And so that's a way to finance uh, projects. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, you know, there are areas where public-private partnerships make sense as long as the terms are, uh, are good. And my experience in 20 years of transportation is that the private sector is very good at negotiating public-private partnerships, and public sector agencies aren't as experienced in dealing with those, with those uh, agreements. And so the terms of the agreement are not always favorable uh, to, the, to the public sector. So... Uh, there's a lot of work going on to up our game uh, on uh, understanding uh, which agreements really work uh, and which don't. I do think that there's a huge uh, future in public-private partnerships in the development of port facilities, for example. Uh, and so those, uh, those kinds of investments also uh, in rail networks, you know, particularly uh, intercontinental rail networks. There's a, there's a lot of, I think, uh, potential We We have uh, port lands in Vancouver that are underdeveloped, so they'll be glad to hear that. Our new Canada line runs, I don't know if you saw it, by single, yeah, I was family, on it. Yeah. single family residential houses. And uh, every city in British Columbia now can issue bonds. Typically, we sell them in New York. <laughs> and, uh, but we don't know about tax increment financing. Can you sort of fill in the gap a little bit about that? Well, it's a, it's a pretty simple idea. The idea is that, you know, you sort of zone, you know, wrap a circle around a project, and you do an assessment to show what 
what the likely beneficiaries are of this, the properties around that. And those properties are assessed as a fee associated with that transit investment. And, you know, New York City is the, you know, we're like the great, great, great grandfather of transit-oriented development. It started in 1904 when we laid out our first transit line. You know, our whole city is basically transit-oriented development. And so a lot of developers uh, made a lot of money uh, early on uh, on that. And so uh, what, what we're doing is on a smaller scale capturing the value, the incremental value, the increase in value of those, uh, the surrounding properties. And, and that's what we use to finance the construction of these rail lines. So, so that increased value, you guys sort of earmark it and set it aside, yeah. and then you use it to uh, service a bond issue. Correct. Yeah. Hi, my name is Gwendol Kesslin. I'm on the board of the Vancouver Cycling Coalition. Uh, and I have a question about uh, money as well. And the question is to your predictions to the future as far as how much every percentage and change in mode share is worth to the Department of Transportation as far as getting more people walking and cycling and, and reducing the pressure on other more expensive uh, transportation infrastructure. No, that's a great, that's a great uh, approach. Um, we don't have that data yet, but we're starting to do it as part of our uh, greenhouse gas planning. And so actually sort of monetizing the value of the externalities that you've got in terms of these kinds of investments is, is a ripe area for anybody that is doing a research project. I mean, this is, this is something that we really need to do a better job of capturing, and it's a, it will be a very effective way to make the case uh, for these kinds of investments. We're able to show the value of public transit, you know, that, you know, we would have had to have built, I think it's 12 new bridges to accommodate uh, the traffic in New York City just today uh, without the transit system. And so we're able to, to model what would the city look like without the transit system. Um, and we're able to model what it means in terms of household income. It saves a family uh, approximately $9,600 a year uh, by not having to have a car, and that's money that can be used to for applied to a mortgage. And so we're looking at uh, location efficient mortgages, and so giving uh, uh, households uh, the ability to have a, a bigger mortgage because they live in a location efficient place. So there are there's some work that's that's been done along the, on the along the margins. I think Larry's done some work. Uh, in this area, and I think the next horizon is also on the health side. So to, to be able to sort of prove out what it means when you have a, a fit population in terms of health care costs versus, you know, the sort of increasing. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the maps from the Center for Disease Control. They do this. It's terrifying. It's like, for me, it's like a Freddy movie. You know, you, you see these big red splotches, you know, and it's like, you know, obesity levels, you know, 10 years ago, and then where they are now, and then where they're projected to go, and it's like the map goes all red. You know, and it's really sort of scary to see. So it's a really, it's a public health crisis that we really need to build more active uh, forms of transportation into our existing network, and we need to do active design guidelines. And we're doing that right now with the health department and with the Department of City Planning so that, you know, we're encouraging buildings, you know, to have elevators that skip the first couple of floors. You know, you have to walk up the first couple of floors, those kinds of things. <laughs> a little controversial. We're not quite there yet, but <laughs> anyway, more must be done. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, when people think of New York City, they often think of Manhattan. So I'm wondering how your approach has been to the other four boroughs. Um, and I'm asking sort of on behalf of Vancouver, people think of just maybe downtown Vancouver here, but there's Burnaby, Richmond, Surrey, um, yeah. who might, which might not be as well served by transit or... That's a really great question. That's a really great question. And I've showed you a lot of projects that sort of showcase our work um, in, in midtown Manhattan, but we have a huge robust program throughout all five boroughs. And the plaza program that you see here is, you know, our first program was actually in the Bronx hub, you know, really messy uh, part of the city. It was a high incident uh, accident location, doing a lot uh, all across the city. And that's why we're also really so strong about bus rapid transit because, you know, it's great for me to want to have more people on buses, but I can't wish them onto buses, and certainly if there are no buses. And so we can deploy it much faster, and so we're looking to, to get transit served in the areas that really don't have it right now, and also when we build it to ensure that they will come, we're really building attractive really surface subways uh, for these for these uh, other areas. And so we've got a, a huge focus on, 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 the, on the pedestrian piece, on the biking piece that 
uh, and, and the bus piece that goes well beyond uh, Midtown Manhattan. But it is a great question. And, you know, you do have very different uh, points of view. You know, uh, as I've learned in my two and a half years, there are like 8.2 million New Yorkers and there are 8.2 million traffic engineers. Because everybody's got a really strong opinion about how their streets should be used. And it d varies from borough to borough. Um, we do over 2,000 meetings with communities uh, each and every year. We do 200 meetings a month. Um, so we're out there all the time. Uh, so it's, it's, a very, it's very important that the outreach is done. And so I hear a lot of that um, from folks. But there is also a, a strong appetite for transit. You know, people really want transit. And so over the next 10 years, we're going to build out between 8 and 10 new, very robust and really true bus rapid transit networks uh, in New York City. And it's because a, it's, a, it's really important to do, and it's a great point. <coughs> Thank you very much. I enjoy your, your talk very much. Um, I, I have, will have two questions. Uh, the first one is that, you know, um, being a Chinese, a, a Chinese Canadian, I can think of um, China as a, a case study of um, transportation, especially in urban centers. I suppose after the People's Republic, was established in 1949 for very obvious reasons, um, uh, using bicycle as a means to talk of uh, commuting is actually is a quite an, a, a social advancement. And in fact, um, so throughout Mao's, th throughout the time of Mao's administration, uh, China is considered the city of bicycles, uh, or, or even the country bicycles. And in fact, as a, as a recently as a 1996. There was a one issue of, of, of um, uh, National, National Geographic. I forgot to bring it with me. The front page was a, 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 a street scene in Shanghai with a just four the completely cyclists. People could look into that. But look what happened today. In other words, I'm talking about is that we have the so-called market forces. I, I hate to be like... Um, the, um, to be here like the, um, the, 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 uh, the soothsayer in Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar and be where the I've launched. I know that there are very, very strong vested interests in our society, both ours in Canada here as well in the States. In fact, it's much more in the States that will, 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 will work tirelessly to undermine, to sabotage this kind of program that you and many other people try to win. I mean, it's a known history that way back in the 40s, that the automotive industry and the petroleum industry conspired mm -hmm. to kill the streetcar system in all American center centuries. So perhaps the time is opportune at this, at this point in time, at this point in moment, that to promote bicycles. But what happened soon after that over? Especially right now, they talk about wanting to uh, re, 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 revitalize the American economy by spending more, you know, building up again is the automobile industry. That well, I, I think it's a really... Let, let me finish, okay? okay. May I? May I? <laughs> okay. So I'm only saying is that uh, uh, um, I, I can see the negative side, the forces of the negative side, wanting to, you know, bite in their time and wait till the time's one winner. Now, the second one, the second question, I'd like you to address this too, is that <laughs> urbanization, urbanization, I consider, is really the, mm, the, mm, the scourge of human, uh, 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 humanity. Maybe, maybe Plato was, was correct that way back to a year ago, and he said that the size of urban center human community should not be more than 5,000 because it's, it is manageable. But when you have millions and tens of millions in large, good and close integration, and you, know, it's, 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 it's like you as a, 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 a senior a municipal uh, administrator, you should know how you know, the, the, the complexity, the immensity, of those problems, a host of them. And, and Canada has reached the milestone earlier this year. The infamous is that 80% of the population living in urban centers, and it's keep on going. 
And when you have so many people, this density in small mm -hmm, geographical setting, people don't have to reread the Lewis Mumford. Let me, let, me, let me start before, because you're going to go on a five-part question here, and I'm not going to be able to follow you. So let me just start with the first part of your question. Um, and that has to do with uh, what's going on in China and what's going on in the United States. And I think, you know, you have seen a transformation in China, you know, s with cycling largely disappearing from large cities. Um, and and I was in health. Beijing uh, a, about a year ago. Let me, let me just finish. Uh, and one of the things that was really interesting, though, is that they're really uh, investing in a bus rapid transit system there. One of the things that's really great to see in Shanghai is that they, they're, building, they're building 14 new lines. They've got, like, 25 cranes, tunnel boring machines uh, in, in Shanghai, and they're putting a, a huge amount of their investment in transit. And so they're very strategic about what they are doing to invest in transit. Uh, for the country, and I think that's a really strong sign. In the United States, we're actually going back to the future. We're looking at the systems that worked 100 years ago and bringing those back. We're looking at streetcars. Over 100 cities uh, in the United States today are looking to build streetcars. People are building uh, light rails. Ferries are, are seeing a, re uh, a resurgence, similarly with biking and walking programs. So we're really turning the clock back to where we were and, and looking at that as a solution going forward. I'd also just finally say that you know the city is uh, the, the the world is increasingly urban, and 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 it's not a bad thing uh, I don't think. And we've got 8.2 million New Yorkers. You know we actually you know we've got people moving back into New York City. They you know we like to be around one another. I don't know maybe you know it's it's different in different parts of the world, but we actually kind of like hanging out. Um, and so it's uh, so the the streets of New York are teeming with lots of people. You know, and I think it's a matter of. How are you approaching and designing your cities to make them livable, to make it, you know, to improve the quality of life there and make them environmentally sustainable? Because I think cities are the future. That's what I mentioned. I mean, we live transit-oriented, energy-efficient lives, you know, with the carbon footprint's down. We're, you know, we're actually saving the planet with cities. And so the struggle is just to make those cities work much better going forward than they do today. And the kinds of strategies that the mayor has outlined in Plan YC is very much, we think, the strategic plan going forward, but it will take a different approach. To do the same approach that we're doing now and to have cities grow is a recipe for disaster. That's really not the strategy. We would, we're not looking at triple decking uh, the street network in New York City. You know, that wouldn't work. So we need to have a new approach, and I think that's what cities are sharing with one another is what works. Let's try some different ideas that work and, 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 and build you know, greater, greener cities. Yeah. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and I'm particularly impressed with the breadth and the comprehensiveness of, of the analysis and of the, and of the implementation. The things that I've liked most about it are your references, your allusion, gentle allusion, to the, the resource of, uh, 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 that the car brought us in terms of a, a continent, uh, with the broadband asphalt, you know, uh, that is, and and the the viewing of that as a huge resource to be purposed uh, uh, to solve many of these conflicts that we're talking about, because it's there, and 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 your reference to the fact that basically to better use it uh, uh, with incredible flexibility, you reference to you know like a can of paint to, uh, to sort of basically rework the whole thing. And one of the things I was particularly interested in, because the, in the whole sort of uh, ongoing turf war uh, with, with regard to the asphalt between pedestrians, motorcycles, and, and bicycles, bicycles get s sort of squeezed out from both ends. And, and, and I noticed in New Westminster, where I'm from, uh, we have, we're building in hard curbs cutting into the asphalt that, that cut bicycles from being able to move through. And I'm wondering, in terms of, can you basically, uh, when you do have incursions into the, into the, the asphalt, uh, to repurpose it from cars to other than cars, can you imagine safely doing all of that with painted curbs so that they're porous? and allow the bicycles to, 
to move in or, or with, and through um, the, the areas and share the areas where, where pedestrians are, um, including the seniors and the children. That's, the, actually, that's the biggest interest I have, because if you could do that, basically it seems to me you, like I'm from the suburbs, and, uh, um, and it's, it sort of solves all those problems of, uh, that, that have been raised here tonight, um, if you can do that. Well, uh, I'm going to show you the picture. I don't even know if, wait, where it is in here of Times Square. Gosh, did I have it? God, I didn't mean to go through the whole show again here. But I could just pull it out. <laughs> uh, no, the the the. Okay, well, look at the book, and you'll see the pictures of <laughs> okay. Times Square. Uh, and what we did in Times Square, and it's a really interesting question, it's sort of a shared streets question. And, uh, you know, when you've got, like in Times Square, when we've got, you know, almost half a million people going through there, how do you design a, a street? Here we go. Um, that is curbless right in there. And you can't see it really, but we've got, uh, there is a bike lane that's, 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 going, that's going through there. And so the, the challenge for us, and I really think I'm going to start it off by, you know, I started it off having bikes dismount in here because the last thing I wanted to do was to have a bike racing through there and right. hitting somebody, you know. I just, right. That's, right. That, that would put the whole program uh, on hold. So until we really get to a point of really respecting one another and being used to one another, right. I think you have to tread really carefully. Yes. And safety is my number one priority, and so... I, I am upset every single time somebody is hurt or killed on the streets of New York. I take it very personally. And so with, with this, I'm, I'm being very careful. But I think in the future, once people get more used to it, I think that you know, we're, not, we're, at, we're not at the cultural tipping point yet where we can, where we can do that. But we are you know, slowly experimenting with, you know, if you take a look at um, right here, you know, this is also curbless right here. You know, you can see it's just a, a line of paint. You know, mm -hmm, the bike mm -hmm. could go into the pedestrian yeah. area, you know. And so, you know, we're just hoping that people really do, you know, Very look out for one another. Yeah. yeah. Three more questions. Three more questions. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. It's been great. Um, you mentioned uh, your congestion pricing debate that you had in New York City, and uh, you, you got most New Yorkers on board with it, and council went through with it after a big consultation process by the sounds of it. And then it got rejected uh, by Albany, as you say, without even, even coming to a vote, which seems to me to just be ridiculous and tragic, but really the sort of thing that happens all the time. Um, that sort of, and not to uh, rag on TransLink by any means, because we've said nice things about them today, and I don't really have anything against TransLink, um, but we in Vancouver don't really have control, and when I say we, we mean, I mean the elected representatives that people in Metro uh, vote to our Metro board and, and other um, levels of regional government, I suppose. Uh, we don't really have control of our own transportation implementation to sort of have it follow our regional growth strategy. Um, we have, um, so anyways, I, I, I don't really need to go on about that, but without stepping on anybody's toes um, or upsetting anybody, uh, you don't have to say anything like that, but uh, <laughs> sorry, I'll leave Plato out of it. That's such a uh, Canadian. I'll, yeah, yeah. Sorry, right yeah. There. <laughs> just, just no big deal, man. I mean, you know, um, uh, it's in, so in an from ideal New York. world, New York is just like boom. You yeah, know, sorry. Right? Yo, so uh, you know what it should be uh, yeah. <laughs> in an ideal world, an ideal no, city, I rather. How how would you have um, in a metro area? How would you, from a governmental uh, perspective, organizationally? How would you have, ideally, your transportation uh, funded, planned, organized, uh, and, and actually implemented? Um, yeah. So you wouldn't have Albany or I actually Victoria the Canadian stopping approach. without a vote. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I actually take a page out of Portland for that. I, I think that their regional growth strategy is a really important one. And the reason why is that it's got teeth. You know, they, you cannot develop beyond uh, the, the, the growth boundary that they've got there, and it channels all of the growth, you know, into, these des into the designated zone. And that provides for a really robust transit system, one that's got a lot of ridership, and, and they're starting to see, I mean, they've got it, incredible performance in terms of their network uh, and, and in terms of the service there. So I really like that as a model, and, and they, uh, they've done a good job of managing uh, financing. Also, they financed their... Uh, extension to the airport uh, privately. It was a public-private partnership. So they, they use a lot of different tools uh, in their toolbox. Uh, so I, I really think that Portland, but, but having, having 
a, a growth boundary and a regional growth strategy that's got teeth in it that's not just notional, you know, that actually uh, is controlling, I think is really important. I think you're, you've done a great job in terms of setting up a regional transportation authority. I think that's, you know, that puts you ahead of the class, you know, in that regard. We've got three different uh, entities in New York City. We've got the MTA, the Port Authority, uh, and the City of New York. And so, you know, we're, we're, we coordinate as best we can, but we do not have one single agency that does it all. That's why we also don't have a regional fare collection uh, program as well. But, but Portland is really my favorite poster child in that regard. In fact, uh, people, I have a son, Max, people think I name my son after the Portland <laughs> light rail system, which is not true. And uh, my husband likes to say that the reason why we didn't have two children was because he didn't want to have a child named Bart. So, <laughs> but I like Portland a lot, so I would look at Portland. <laughs> Yeah, but their transportation and land use planning are really tight, and that's, that's, the, that's the key. Uh, hi, thanks. I have a brilliant presentation. I'm a huge fan of the potted plants. I think it's a, <laughs> just an amazing idea, you know, why waste time digging in the ground? Just, okay. um, anyway, uh, I, we're with my colleague here running a very small plan for a town of Ladysmith. It's only got a couple thousand people, and no one rides there because they're basically, they're interested, but they're afraid to get on their bikes. And you mentioned in New York there's a huge hunger for riding bicycles, and that's maybe the wedge of people who have always wanted to ride and now they'll have an opportunity. Uh, how do you go further beyond that and hit the, the larger wedge of people who, you know, are kind of skeptical about riding a bike and maybe will never really get on one but really should be on a bike? Mm -hmm. Well, we are doing a lot. Like when we do the Summer Streets program, we, do, we teach people how to ride bikes. You know, for people that, you know, we provide bikes there, and we provide free bike helmets. We gave away, we've given away 25,000 free bike helmets. Um, so we do everything we can to make it easy for people to get on a bike and, and ride it. And, you know, people are, can be a little embarrassed, you know. They kind of want to ride a bike, but they're scared to ride a bike. And so that's why, you know, the Summer Streets program, the Weekend Walks programs, all that kind of, that is a really great opportunity to, to, to get people comfortable uh, with that notion. Sure, and on the flip side, are you somehow mitigating um, cyclist driver interactions where, uh, at least here in Vancouver, there's quite a bit of acrimony between the two camps and it's causing a lot of people to be very frightened? No, to everybody's be totally road. happy. They're just, you yeah. know, like, oh, yeah. well, just fine. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're, it's, it's a war out there, you know, it's a, so, you know, you do what you can, you know, and so we're doing a lot of education, we're doing a lot of outreach, we've got, we're working with Transportation Alternatives, which is our local bike advocacy group, they're terrific, and then we've got a whole biking rules and bike etiquette piece, but, you know, etiquette in New Yorkers don't necessarily go naturally hand in hand when you sort of think about it, even though we are, you know, the best. Um, but it is, you know, and New Yorkers in some senses I've seen like you know, traffic signals are suggestions, you know, it's a thought. Uh, so, but yeah, we're working on a lot of work uh, teaching kids and teaching communities and teaching drivers and there's a whole outreach campaign. There's, there's more to be done. That's actually an area where I'm really looking for other ideas. Um, from other cities in terms of what they're doing. It's something that cities are really struggling with because if you're building in a whole new mobility network, you really, you know, it's, there's a competition for, for that limited street space. And so we really have to be better and more gentle with one another. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for a great presentation. Great. Uh, you mentioned a focus on driving down injuries, and uh, that's of real interest. We're um, involved in a pedestrian safety project here in the downtown east side. And uh, that's our uh, sort of ground zero where um, uh, we have a lot of uh, social challenges in that neighborhood and uh, a lot of capacity building is going into that neighborhood, but um, this is focusing on the pedestrian realm. So I'm wondering in terms of what metrics you're using, um, what agencies you're involving, and uh, in terms of the three E's of engineering, education, enforcement, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of great pictures of the uh, engineering things you've done, I'm wondering, in, in balancing those things, if you could just speak a little bit more about addressing safety, in particular pedestrian safety, and imagine if you had eight weeks to implement something, what you might, what you might suggest. Are you implementing something in eight weeks? <laughs> uh, well, that'll be up to Gregor Robertson, I guess, but um, no, we're, we're working in the neighborhood on an eight-week project, and so, you know, it, it's what can we do that, that will have an impact, but... Um, well, I'm a big fan of a five-letter word called pilot. Yeah. And so I think that, 
you know, communities also know their streets better than anybody else. And so, because they live it, walk it, ride it every day. And so I think that working with the community to say, what are the big problem intersections? Where do you want to work? Where, what, what is something that's a big problem? And then go out and paint it. You know, go paint some sidewalks, go extensions, go put some potted plants out there, go, you know, try to make it, you know, do some sort of really quick traffic calming. Okay. Uh, and if you do it on a pilot program basis, who's going to object? You know, this, make sure that you've got the statistics. Yeah. <laughs> so if you've got, like, a lot of traffic injuries in this part, you know, there's, that's the reason why you, you can't have 10 people getting hit a year, you know, that kind of a thing. Or yep. people focus, look at your it's demographics. every nine days, actually, someone gets, a pedestrian gets struck in the downtown east side every nine days. So, it, you know, it, we can make a difference in eight weeks, certainly. And, uh, in, in 1990, yep. uh, a, a pedestrian was killed every day on the streets of New York. Wow. It was 365 deaths okay. a year. And, and so... Any little bit about the enforcement side, do you involve your police department when you're doing these? Uh, do you sort of lay off on enforcement at the beginning, or how do you handle it? We enforcement? use enforcement a lot when we're implementing bus projects, you know, to keep the lanes clear. Um, in this, we're really sort of engineering safety into the street. And so when you do these kinds of designs, you, you know, you really create a very different streetscape. You have a much more vibrant, more interesting, you, you have much more interesting places. And so you actually give visual cues to drivers that something different is going on here. They see, they see bikes, they see pedestrians, they see trees. Oh my God, it's, you know, chaos out here. They better slow down. And so that, you know, is, I think, an effective sort of side benefit. Uh, to the program. Great, thank you. Maybe the last question? Um, or the last two questions? <laughs> yeah. You'll um, have to I, negotiate that, could. I guess. Um, earlier on, someone asked you uh, what uh, uh, Vancouver could benefit from, from, from New York's uh, rollout of bikeways and so on, and, and I don't think you quite answered that question. I would volunteer that uh, somewhere in your presentation you showed covered bike shelters. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think you've noticed it uh, today, but normally this is a very rainy place. And, uh, it's always been shiny and sunny when I've been yeah. here. It's <laughs> probably part of your secret story. It rains here all the time. You're just like Portland, right? Keep people away by saying, oh, you don't want to come here. It's all rainy. Well, I'll just say you've been very fortunate during oh, okay. your visit here. See, so, it continues. <laughs> So uh, I really think that one of the lessons we can learn from here, from your presentation, is if we could have more covered bike shelters, that would be really terrific. But to ask a question here, perhaps I could ask again, what do you think from your experience about uh, rolling out more bikeways and so forth uh, in New York, we could learn here? Well, I think more is better. Um, and I think you, you provide more connectivity. You make it easier for people to get from point A to point B. And so you really need to fill in your network. And so, and if you can create protected bike lanes, that's really the best. Um, in some areas, you're not going to be able to do that. The streets are not going to uh, accommodate that. And so you have to be really targeted in terms of where you're, where, where you're building out. I, you know, I would like to, at some point, do a bike share program. So I'm focusing in like heavily in some of the areas where I might, might want to do that. But you have to be very strategic about where, where you do it. And I think that um, yeah, building out your network is, is a really important piece. I also think getting uh, indoor bike parking uh, in existing buildings is a, is a really good piece, and so I look forward to your championship of uh, the legislation uh, to get that done. Yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, the uh, painted streets are very whimsical and highly audacious at the same time, um, but there's an intentionality to them, which uh, makes them also quite a beautiful contribution to the city as well. Um, this is not a question, this is actually an announcement. Um, if the owner of a yellow Brody mountain bike, a yellow Brody mountain bike locked up downstairs could join me, um, you have locked your bike to someone else's bike, <laughs> and she needs to leave now. And on that note... I actually, I don't think I've ever been to uh, an event where people have actually applauded the PowerPoint slides. <laughs> that was pretty unique. Well, There's look. No writing on them. That's yeah. Uh, this is one Broadway show we're really glad you bought on the road. And I think I can predict when there were. were <laughs> I'm going to stretch this metaphor. Hold on. 
when the reviews come out tomorrow, a hit. <laughs> Standing room only. You were great. Thanks. Thanks so much, and we hope you come back. Here's something that may draw you. Jeanette, Sadekon. Thank you.